je devais résumer la vie branche avec vous aujourd'hui, je dirais que c'est d'abord des rencontres. Des rencontres entre étudiants appartenant à différents laboratoires, différentes entreprises, mais aussi avec des chercheurs venant du monde entier. Nous accueillons tous les étudiants appartenant au domaine de l'électronique, au sens large. Nous donnons la possibilité à ces étudiants membres de créer leur réseau professionnel dans des domaines qui leur tiennent à cœur. Être membre Vibranche, et donc membre I3E par extension, cela vous donne beaucoup d'avantages. Notamment, vous aurez accès à une grande librairie d'articles de conférences en électronique, mais aussi à l'actualité des dernières technologies et aux événements organisés par les entreprises de France. Mais avant tout, cela vous permet de faire partie d'une des plus grandes communautés scientifiques mondiales. Et tout cela pour seulement 20 dollars. Sur le campus bordelais, on organise des événements à peu près tous les mois, sur place ou sous forme de virtual event, au cours desquels on a des invités tels que des chercheurs. Mais on permet aussi aux étudiants du campus bordelais de transformer leurs projets d'études en projets I3E, en ayant un soutien financier et nous les accompagnons aussi dans l'écriture d'articles scientifiques afin qu'ils aillent en conférence par la suite. Être à la Vibranche, c'est faire partie d'une équipe dynamique et soudée pour promouvoir la science. Pour moi, la Vibranche, c'est l'occasion et l'opportunité de changer son quotidien d'étudiant. C'est l'occasion d'organiser tout plein de choses, des séminaires, des journées thématiques ou encore des concours technologiques autour de divers sujets scientifiques. Rejoignez la Vibranche. Tiens, la Vibranche. Donc rejoignez tous la Vibranche. On était à la Vibranche. On est chuté à la Bibranche. definitely changes your life. It helps you establish relationships that are really tighter because you already have a lot of things in common in the way you think, work, want to change the world around you. As, as you get involved in IEEE, you, you really get a sense that you want to give back and to grow the community that you have. I think there's a natural intersection between IEEE and its role in promoting the emergence of new technologies and entrepreneurship. IEEE was a great uh, channel to get to connect with professionals in the field. You never know what's going to happen when you meet so prominent people that are foreseeing the future. What has IEEE brought me? I've worked full-time in power system automation, which we call Smart Grid, for over 41 years now, full-time. And the job changes I've made were through industry friends that knew of opportunities that I wouldn't have known otherwise and opened up the door for me. And many of these industry friends I met through IEEE. What other place can you try to take a risk of doing our presentation skills and bringing in somebody from industry to talk to other scientists and engineers? I've been a member of IEEE for 25 years and I still talk and mentor about this to this day. IEEE has given me opportunities to network in terms of getting to know the leaders in the field and also has provided an outlet for those leaders to know what I'm doing. So uh, it's been um, uh, good for both of us. Given the world that we're living in now, where everything is pretty much about the internet and, and about connectivity, um, it's, it's actually a good time to be um, an engineer and to be a telecommunication and networking engineer. We know it's about the dynamics between people and people groups where our future is. And engineers can facilitate that, but they don't have the answers. It's the answering of us together as a community, not as engineers alone. So engineering is not going to solve the world, but it's going to facilitate. That, uh, that problem solving and getting together. At IEEE, we believe technologists are the key drivers of tomorrow's innovation because we can really do what IEEE's motto states. We can advance technology for the benefit of humanity. I always wanted my education to mean something more than just, you know, um, doing a day job that pays my checks. I wanted to see how my background in engineering and other things could have an impact that can make somebody's life better. Being able to connect our members with younger students and engaging them to emphasize that it is important that what they are pursuing in their STEM careers is truly going to be the next 
thing that affects all of humanity because all technology that we make is affecting people. And it's not just IEEE members, it's everybody. The mission of IEEE students is to deliver a common, high quality IEEE student membership experience globally for lifelong professional membership through IEEE. IEEE is a family. The friends you build through volunteering stay there. You really make friends for life. Getting involved at your local student branch, your local section, and your larger region is one of the many benefits that IEEE students have. You can also apply for a variety of awards both as an individual and as an IEEE student member of your local branch. You can also get involved in a variety of contests and competitions, including our number one student competition, IEEE Extreme, a 24-hour global coding competition with over 8,000 students involved annually. IEEE Potentials is a premier student magazine. It provides you with the opportunity to get published and to review your peers' work as well. With over 400,000 members in the IEEE Global Network, you can get connected, find a mentor, and also collaborate with professionals in your field. If you want to do something to impact your community through IEEE, it gives you the resources. You can make the most of your IEEE membership by completing your profile. It allows us to contact you and keep you up to date with what's happening at the global IEEE offices. Take advantage of being an IEEE student member by collaborating on projects within your local student branch and your section with professional members. By collaborating on projects, you have the opportunity to get featured on IEEE TV. We'll see you there. Epics in IEEE empower students and local communities around the world to apply engineering to solve those challenges. The IEEE Event Finder allows you to locate conferences, meetings, events, and activities in your area and worldwide. You can get involved in a variety of special interest groups as well. Women in Engineering, Standards, and IEEE Young Professionals. YP represent! <laughs> of course, that's when you graduate. Remember, IEEE prides itself on being your professional home. Be sure to take advantage of everything the IEEE has to offer. The more you put in, the more you get out. We share the same fears, we share the same hopes, we share the same visions. And this is the best place we can exchange our experience and at the same time we can get support from our experienced colleagues at the same time. It's perfect. Hello everyone and welcome in our BTOC series. I am Ayubay Teda, the Vice, Vice Chair of CAS Society in the B branch, the IEEE student branch here in Bordeaux. And I will be your moderator for this talk. Uh, today we are honored to welcome uh, Professor Matik Orgazalk uh, in this talk, but uh, before uh, proceed to the main event and um, well, I will announce some upcoming events. So the talk series for November, uh, today we'll have the talk uh, by uh, Professor uh, Matik Orgazak uh, from University of Kharkov. And next week we'll have Andri uh, Vladimirescu from uh, both uh, University of Berkeley and the ECAP, uh, France. Uh, the third week, we'll uh, uh, invite Jean-Michel Roudoutet from University of Liège, and uh, we'll have also Victor Grimplap from uh, Synopsis Chill. So the next talk, uh, as I mentioned, will be uh, held, will be given by Professor André Vladimirovsky uh, about la, la poule et l'œuf de la simulation en électronique. Um, mm -hmm. In the, uh, our friend in Porto Alegre also held a talk tomorrow. Uh, they invite Professor Cecilia Metra uh, to talk about safety and reliability challenge to enable high autonomous intelligence system. So, uh, so uh, also the University of Porto Alegre organized a workshop uh, Rio Grande de Sol workshop where they invite many uh, guests and uh, giving uh, interesting talks. 
Uh, there is also seasonal school uh, 2020 in mid-November about uh, technology and agribusiness. Uh, and in, uh, uh, in uh, mid-November, there is the Act in Space 2020, where students act in space through some uh, space challenges. And uh, this, uh, the, the event in Bordeaux will be in virtual edition this year. There is uh, also ECO CS 2020, which will be in uh, Glasgow, Scotland, from the 23rd to 25th of November. And there is a call for paper for ISCAS 2021 from May 23rd to, uh, to 26th. And finally, there is the IEEE Seasonal School on IoT here in Bordeaux, the third edition, and will be in uh, the last of May to the 4th of June. Okay. So uh, now I will let uh, Professor Francois Rivet to give to address our guest some, uh, some, some few words. Merci Ayub. Uh, so thank you Mashek to have accepted Bordeaux invitation. Uh, we are proud to have you today. As it is important to mention that you are a former IEEE CAS president. Thanks to your service, students can appreciate the strengths of IEEE and especially today as the B Talks are sponsored by IEEE CAS. So it's a pleasure to know you personally since this great dinner we had at Vancouver in Canada. It's always good times uh, when we meet, not only about science, but also about sharing nice food and fine wines, and especially such as the great IEEE ASIC conference you organized in Krakow uh, in Poland. So I've said too much. Thank you again to be virtually with us at Bordeaux, and I hope we'll be together soon in Bordeaux in real. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rive. So before we proceed to the, our talk, I will uh, introduce our uh, guest. So Professor Machik Orgazelk, he is a professor of electrical engineer and computer science and head of department of information technology in Ugolianian University Kharkov in Poland. Uh, he held several visiting positions in Denmark, Switzerland, Germany, Spain, Japan, and Hong Kong. And he received a research award from Ministry of Education of Spain in 2000 and worked for one year at National Microelectronics Center in Sevilla, Spain. In 2001, he received a senior award from Japan Society for Promotion of Science as visiting professor in Kyoto University. And in 2005, he had Hertie Foundation Fellowship at the Guti University of Frankfurt and Maine. And from 2006 to 2009, he held the chair of biosignal and system in Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Thank you again, Professor Machek, for accepting our invitation. And now the B Talks floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can see my screen uh, now. With this full screen, I I don't see other. <laughs> Uh, programs running, so um, I have little control of uh, what is happening. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, you and uh, Professor Francois Rivet for for this invitation. Uh, as he mentioned, we we met uh, some years ago, and uh, it was a very nice uh, encounter when we first met. And ever since we uh, we keep contacts, and it gives me a special pleasure to to uh, talk to young people, and to be able even now in this difficult time when we cannot move and cannot travel, uh, to to share my views and some of my passions also, uh, of my my uh, work. Uh, with young people, you know, around the globe, I gave uh, another talk for the for the Port Alegre chapter some time ago, and I give many other talks uh, uh, in many different places without moving from from home. Okay, uh, so I, I uh, put this title for this talk. You know, microelectronics is going 3D, uh, and I would like to tell you a little bit what is. Uh, 
currently happening in this domain and uh, what we can expect possibly in the next uh, years to come. Uh, I put here on this first slide also a map of Europe uh, so you can localize where I am sitting at this moment. So a few thousand kilometers, probably uh, two and a half thousand kilometers from Bordeaux. Uh, Krakow, my city, uh, is in the south of Poland, as you can see on the on the bottom right of the slide. Uh, my university, actually, when, when I am working my, the last 15 years, uh, we call it the Agelonian University from the name of the king who founded the, the, the university in 14th century. So it's pretty, uh, you know, uh, old university, old institution. It was the oldest university in Poland. And actually, uh, I think 12 years after the university in Prague was uh, founded. Uh, so, the, well, ob obviously we have some very old buildings. The, the building which is visible in this uh, slide is uh, 1401, so just the beginning of 15th century. It's only used as a museum and uh, for ceremonial purposes. Uh, <clears throat> my faculty now, it's on the, in the new campus, as we call it. It's uh, outside the city center. And uh, one of the famous people which we had some time ago with us was uh, Stefan Banach. So those who do automatic control, probably, you know, Banach spaces. So th this is the gentleman. He was professor of mathematics uh, just next door. And the, the most famous of our uh, students was uh, Copernicus. Uh, actually, he was a student of the Krakow Academy, uh, as it was called in those days. Exactly uh, in 40, uh, 1492, 93, 95. So the time where, where uh, Europeans discovered America. So when uh, Columbus uh, made his uh, uh, big discovery. Okay, so in, in those days, uh, my university uh, had already uh, more than 3,000 students, and you know nowadays we have almost 40,000 students. This is a pretty big institution. Okay, so that's about my my you know place where I where I am working, and it's it's really an interesting place place to be, and uh, many interesting things uh, happening around. So. Um, if I if I begin uh, my lecture with uh, just a, a small uh, review of uh, uh, integration uh, for for qu quite uh, some time, people were trying to make uh, you know the ever since electricity was discovered, were trying to build something useful. Uh, and uh, and really something useful <laughs> started being built with the invention of uh, electric valves and and later transistors. And the big uh, breakthrough came uh, not so long time ago, around 1950, uh, 1949. Actually, the first patent was filed and with patent for a five transistor amplifier. Five transistors put. Uh, together in one uh, crystal, but it was never realized. So that, that was just a concept. And uh, a few years later, the, the first invention was really demonstrated. Jack Kilby of Texas Instruments demonstrated the first working integrated uh, example uh, in 1958. Uh, this is the one you you can see on the on the upper slide, where, where you can see the wires sticking around also, uh, and the, the slightly better version in on the on the lower slide. So um, integrated circuits were you know very very fast uh, took very fast pace. So if you consider that in 1959, uh, so 60 years ago. We had only four transistors on the chip in one integrated circuit. Uh, Ten years later, we had the, the chips that contained 200 
transistors. The technology was also different already because uh, the MOS transistors were introduced. And nowadays we, we are just, I just show one example here, which I had at hand, uh, NVIDIA Kepler, which had 7.0 weight billion transistors. So you can see that the, this, the technology advanced so fast that uh, uh, integration really became uh, what, what we call, you know, putting uh, functionality on the chip, uh, doing more and more useful things for us was the, was the key invention here. Uh, I would like to, to draw your attention to the following fact. From the beginning, all circuits were built on flat surfaces. So those first integrated circuits, they, they had a flat surface at the bottom and whatever was uh, being on, uh, you know, the functional elements, the, the interconnections, the, the wires were put on the top of it. And actually, if we if we think about it, uh, why this was uh, happening this way? Well, first of all, you know, <laughs> somehow we humans uh, have this uh, good uh, perception of of flat surfaces. We uh, uh, like to stand on the on the flat floor, and and then we uh, we put many other things on the top of that. Uh, not necessarily other types of, of surfaces are, are uh, widely accepted. So if we are building our houses, we, we usually also flatten the, the, the surface in a way to, to construct something on the top of it. But really the, the enabler of the whole technology was uh, invention uh, or a concept uh, launched by uh, Swiss uh, engineer working for Fairchild Semiconductor at that time, uh, Jean Erny, uh, who uh, introduced something later called uh, a planar circuit concept. Possibly those of you who who followed courses in of semiconductors or have already heard about this idea, but he, his idea was to well, when we we put the transistors on the on the bottom layers on the flat uh, surface onto which we we build the transistors, then we can put a silicon dioxide as an insulator, and then on the top of that we we can put uh, various kinds of metal layers and and again uh, uh, dioxide uh, oxide layers to uh, replace the wire. Okay, so instead of wires, we are using several layers of metal uh, between them, the, the insulator, and ob obviously shaping those uh, uh, paths in the metal layers. We can we can connect uh, transistors in the at the bottom layer. And the sec the second uh, uh, enabler was uh, also uh, that. To build these uh, layers, we, we could use uh, technologies that uh, widely use uh, the planar concept as well. I will mention uh, uh, them in the next slides. Uh, how, how do we start? Well, those first circuits that contained only four or 12 transistors, they, they were built on simply a, a small slice of uh, crystal that was easy, relatively easy to make in the lab. But now nowadays we are making uh, chips, integrated circuits on uh, wafers, what we call wafers. Wafers are slices of uh, a monocrystal of uh, silicon. Also some other materials are used, but mostly silicon. Those uh, uh, monocrystals are fabricated uh, using a method or technology which was uh, developed by actually a Polish en engineer, uh, Mr. Czochralski. Uh, and uh, we are able to, to cut this big ingot that is visible on the left side of the screen into, into sl very thin slices, uh, very flat and very high purity uh, the, the technology is very advanced. So we have the, the flat surface onto which uh, we can build very complicated uh, structures and, and very interesting uh, interconnections. And, and those millions of transistors are built 
onto the flat surface of silicon wafer. Okay, so we built circuits on the flat surface. And we also have flat, so-called flat uh, processes. Uh, treatment of this uh, flat surface is done by photolithography, deposition, oxidation, ion implantation, passivation, all these technologies are planotypes. So, so we use either uh, photographic technologies, uh, covering the, the layers with the photo um, layers that can, can later be removed and just uh, cover those, those places that have uh, later be etched or, or treated by some other technology. Uh, another thing which I would like to, to stress that <clears throat> existing technologies mostly have rectangular or cuboid uh, shapes and almost all the connections composed are of rectilinear wireless crossing or at 90 degrees. So we, we have pr pretty <clears throat> straightforward geometry in whatever we are fabricating so far. And we made, a, over the years, we made a huge progress. Uh, I, I marked here in red on the top of this, uh, so you can see Intel 8086, that was, was my first desktop computer. And I was extremely happy to have it, but, but the 8086 had 29,000 transistors inside. Uh, and actually, I, I always remember that the big uh, thing about that computer was that I, I had 10 megabyte hard disk. Probably the weight of it was three kilograms. <laughs> I mentioned this because I, I will talk if, tell you a few words about memories nowadays. And, uh, and those uh, things that are in green here, these are the processors that we see in our, in our Apple iPhones nowadays. But you can, you can also see uh, the, the Chinese development, for example, the Kirin 980 here at the bottom. Uh, so the Chinese are, are keeping the pace and, and even in some areas that they have truly fantastic uh, uh, developments. And the complexity, as you can see, was growing over the years. Uh, so from those four transistors, uh, uh, 500 transistors, uh, 29,000 nowadays we have, uh, especially in the GPU, so graphic processors and uh, programmable gate arrays, we, we have unbelievable densities and uh, uh, we have chips that have 50 billion transistors on the chip. And and this is still not, uh, not the end of the story. So, and everything was flat, okay? So now, a few years ago, people started uh, discussing that uh, what is what the, the, this kind of development of uh, or, or there is a scaling low. Uh, uh, Gordon Moore, uh, who was the one of the founders of Intel, he uh, proposed uh, you know many years ago. He wrote an article around 1969, uh, saying that the number of transistors. So the, he observed that this is an observation. It's not a not a proven result, but just an observation of what was happening, that the number of transistors was basically doubling on the chip every 11 months. And uh, why this was happening? No, because the, the, the feature sizes of the, the transistors were getting smaller and smaller, and the, the wires thinner and thinner. Uh, improved technology was offering this, this huge developments. As some people predicted that, as you can see in this slide, uh, Moore's law scaling will be dead by 2021. We are already in 2020, and, and I think this this uh, guess is, is still not valid. We, we still observe some uh, progress in scaling, but probably uh, in the, the six years ago um, or five years ago, this prediction uh, was already mentioning, you know, that it will be replaced by 3D integration. Uh, why, why people think that we are approaching the limit with current technologies, so the flat stuff? Uh, first of all, the, the, the chips are becoming very big. So the footprint, the size of the, of the integrated circuit, around 500 square millimeters, the problem is economic. So the production yield becomes low. Uh, if the if the area of the chip grows, the cost grows exponentially. 
Uh, next next thing is the is the fabrication uh, the feature size so the size of the transistor of the electrodes of the transistor so we we already passed the uh, seven nanometer technology we people are talking about three nanometer feature size what is next well, i will make one comment here in a minute and uh, obviously with the feature size goes uh, also the interconnect path so how closely we can put the wires one next to another and uh, if we have so many transistors we have to connect them or make connections between them so the length of the of the wires on the chip apart from billions of transistors we have kilometers of wiring kilometers of uh, conducting uh, passes uh, ob obviously those uh, conducting paths they also introduce delays so the signals on the chip are significantly delayed uh, if we put more transistors, the power dissipation on chip becomes uh, unbearable at some moment. So we have power efficiency bottleneck. And uh, uh, very significant from the point of view of uh, industry applications or building the circuitry in reality is uh, the cost of verification and testing. Extremely complicated circuits are extremely uh, uh, expensive to be tested and verified you need big uh, pieces of equipment good big uh, uh, groups of people to do it okay where are the limits uh, so first limit the scaling is is nearing atomic limits so just just consider one thing i i put here on the on the right uh, a cross section of one transistor not not so such an advanced technology but still here you can see that the gate of the MOS transistor is 11 angstrom so it's uh, uh, angstrom is one tenth of a nanometer okay so 11 angstrom is one nanometer and we are talking about three nanometer technology and the distance between the silicon uh, atoms in the silicon crystal is around three angstrom so 0.3 nanometer so if if we have three nanometer uh, gate we basically have a cross uh, around 10 atoms of um, silicon a very very small number of atoms and obviously uh, at that scale we are hardly controlling uh, anything any properties if you want to to add doping to create uh, uh, transistors uh, doping becomes random in such small uh, cubicles, you can see that uh, uh, randomly we have maybe uh, 56 dopants here of 24 dopants. So, so the properties of the of the elements of the transistors are are just becoming random. Okay, the second challenge which we cannot change is is the interconnect. <clears throat> Actually, on the chip we have three big distribution networks. We have we have to power all the all the transistors so to bring the voltages to make them work we have the clock distribution and then we have the the signals so the useful signal has to pass uh, we have to input the signal somewhere and get the you what useful we have done with it uh, at some part of the chip at the, in another part so we have three extremely uh, complicated complex structures that we have to put in in the geometric structure of the chip <coughs> uh, here i show you the, just a very uh, shortly uh, uh, we, we have the the transistors on the bottom layer so the active layers is at the bottom or here and and on the top of it we have various types of interconnections so the power lines the the big ones here and and on the top of it we we just connect to outside world um i hope this will work i found a, this little movie to show you <laughs> we can make a, a very fast travel inside the the telephone and you will see from outside we do not see anything but it it has this uh, three billion transistors inside and we magnify 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 and we start seeing the 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 three-dimensional scaffolding there okay but but still 
all the active elements, all the transistors are on the, on the flat surface, but on the top of it, we, we have this uh, interconnect layers. So all these are just wires that connect, uh, well, uh, those places on the chip that have to be connected together. And here we can see we have 15 nanometer pitch and overlays of four nanometers. So everything becomes uh, really in the, in the range of uh, uh, atom sizes. Uh, it, with the improvement of the technologies, we introduce more problems with the interconnects. So nowadays, uh, uh, current technologies, the, the wires have, the total length is more than 10 kilometers. Okay? And obviously we have various, uh, other, you know, when we had four or 12 or 100 transistors, we could connect them directly, all of them with anything. Uh, later, we introduce uh, the concept of buses on the chip. The concepts that, that were used in telecommunication were introduced also on, in chip technology. And uh, with the lens of the wires, we, we have uh, the problem of uh, uh, time delays. So ac actually, the, the arithmetic operation is very short, very fast. And with improving technology, it's getting shorter. But the, the length of the path, of the signal path, makes delays. So here you can see that uh, this is why we, we, we have clocking on the, on the chip. Because uh, some parts of the chip have to wait for the signal to arrive where the, it has to arrive. Because the signal delays are, are too, too big. Okay. So uh, arithmetic operation basically is 10 times faster than any kind of data transfer. So data transfer becomes a major problem. What are the solutions? The solutions are, uh, first of all, we can further shrink the feature size and, and see what happens. Uh, we can introduce new geometries, new geometries of transistors also. And also we, we can put not only wiring on the one on the top of the other layer, but we can put also active elements, transistors in stacks or whole blocks in stacks. We can also look for different new technologies or invent new types of elements and architectures. Uh, the development of next uh, technological steps, so the, making the transistors smaller, is extremely uh, expensive. So even the big players on the market they, uh, at some point, they decided that uh, for, for current uh, uh, requirements, we, we really do not need those. So those technologies that are smaller than, than seven nanometers are just too expensive, that there is no market for such so expensive chips. And uh, for example, Global Foundries uh, stopped a couple of years ago the whole seven nanometer work, FinFET technology. Uh, TSMC, so the Taiwanese uh, company that is one of the leaders in the world, is still working on five nanometers and also talking about three nanometers. But as you can see here, the the, the gains are not, not so big. This is their prediction, their tables. Okay, So big investment produces only a 20% power reduction 15% gain in performance. So th this is pretty low. Depends how much it costs, obviously, but the cost is huge. Here, here's the comparison of the costs. So look at that. To design one chip, th th this is just to design one, uh, one chip. What is the cost in different technologies? So in seven nanometer technology, the cost is around $300 million. For five nanometer, it's already 542 million. And they say that for three nanometer, it cost is expected $1 billion for one single chip. And they, 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 there is a breakdown in this uh, slide, so you can see how much, look how much costs uh, the ver verification and validation. Okay. So these parts are pretty big, but also the, the software that is running on the chip is 
is very, very large. The cost of development is very large. OK, so transistors going 3D. So first solution, transistor on the flat surface, uh, the, the electrodes are too small. The transistors are very uh, difficult to control the processes in that scale. So what, what do we can get? So f f one of the first uh, ideas people started to build was introducing three-dimensional structures. So making the electrodes of MOS transistors uh, in a vertical, so adding them vertical uh, dimension. Normally, they, they were like in the, for example, in the B uh, uh, drawing here, they, they were flat slabs. Okay? Here, the vertical dimension becomes large. In this way, obviously, it's much more difficult to fabricate, but we are gaining control. Okay, so so the the gate which is put around this uh, slab is uh, the the magnet the field the electric field that is controlling the flow of the of the current. Uh, it, the influence is much much stronger, and the new concepts that are uh, introduced in recent years also talk about new materials. So the last uh, drawing here shows you the vertical nanowire transistor. So we don't use layers here. We introduce vertical wire, very, very thin one, nanowire. And around, we put the gate. So the electrode, which is modulating the, the current flow in the, in the vertical wire. So the transistors, are we can make them smaller because we we put the electrodes in the in the vertical dimension okay. and there, there are many articles you can find in different uh, journals and it really works and people are talking about uh, or making fab fabricating the chips uh, vertical nanowire arrays they already being built and many interesting developments uh, in in france uh, Actually, in Lyon, uh, there is a very strong group who is trying to do it, uh, led by Ian O'Connor. And the latest from these developments are so-called nanosheet transistors. Again, we, we, go, we grow vertically. So the transistors go, grow vertically. Th this is the flat layer on the bottom. And we grow the transistors of putting the electrodes uh, one on the top of the other, just in every single transistor. And, th and these are being fabricated, both uh, uh, FinFET, so those uh, sticking uh, up electrodes and uh, nanosheet transistors are being fabricated. Okay, new architectures. Uh, so we move from 2D, the concept from to, mo to move from 2D to 3D, to three-dimensional structure. It's like we uh, we we actually um, copied the concept that the architects started using in building in city centers, when the surface of the ground is becoming very expensive. They started building uh, skyscrapers, like in New York. Okay, so we are we are trying to do something similar, but on a, but on a nano scale. So the dimensions here are, are nanometers. And instead of putting, you know, things like bungalows or houses on the on the on one level, we, we just put many many stories, putting the different functional uh, layers on, one on the top of the of the other. So in the, in this way, we can, uh, you know, if if I want to to connect this uh, uh, corner here of the DSP, the the yellow block to the a blue corner here of the optical input output. Uh, I can I can go around the chip, or I can go vertically, okay? like like in the building. We in the, in uh, buildings, in the cities we we have uh, uh, piping structures bringing water, gas, uh, uh, taking out sewage or introducing air, air conditioning, all kinds of installations that are inside. In a similar way, we, we try to do something similar in uh, micro scale in the micro circuits. So uh, just to show you the evolution, 
we had single chip packages uh, we we can build uh, multi chip packages they are still the, the the substrate is flat and we can start building things going up building th three dimensional structures here we have something which we call two and a half dimensional because we we have the functional elements are still flat but to connect them we introduce a, a special layer which is called the silicon interposer so this this is brought in at the, at the beginning it was brought in only for the purpose of uh, shortening the wires of interconnect and finally comes the 3d design so we we have those slices or those blocks that are fabricated on flat surfaces put on one on the top of the other and to reduce the the wiring we just drill the holes okay and we put the connections vertically through silicon and they are called through silicon vias okay so the this kind of uh, structure you can imagine building many of the layers one on the top of the other so dyes are produced in different processes can be from the same process but can be from different processes we can just uh, connect them and uh, and uh, basically construct a very complicated uh, three-dimensional structure okay uh, for the for the packaging or for connecting the external to external world we have uh, uh, external wires or or we can put uh, 3d con through silicon vias or package and package as you can see the different ways of different uh, ideas that people come up with and uh, they are still developing uh, some pictures from different producers and here are real si through silicon vias just to show you some examples okay uh, actually, this this idea looks very attractive, but uh, su such a um, construction brings uh, many new problems. So this is good for scientists, scientists like uh, solving problems. Uh, so, for example, uh, those uh, pillars here, the, the vias, they are usually uh, constructed from a different material than, than silicon. So, uh, for example, tungsten or copper, sometimes they are polysilicon as well. But basically, the introduction of a different material brings new problems because they have different properties, different thermal properties, different mechanical properties. This whole structure, like a, like a building, architectural construction, has to be stable. So we, we do not want to introduce... Uh, uh, here the interconnects that it will for example break the chip because the thermal expansion like for copper is much bigger than from anything for anything else and and often the the, the chips break mechanically because of uh, uh, of heating problems so we we have to be very careful selecting materials selecting the, the distances the pitches as we as we say the sizes of this uh, elements uh, many, many, many new uh, problems that have to be solved. Uh, we can, with through silicon vias, we can we can imagine, for example, such a chip that has a microprocessor at the bottom. Then next layer has uh, memory, and then uh, on the top we can put also some analog circuitry like, like uh, RF interconnect. Okay, so so something to send information by radio waves. Uh, and and these are being used. So we have already uh, developments in this in this uh, area. Uh, we we can go further because we we can think about introducing uh, uh, power. Okay? We we can think about introducing sensors. So we can have optical sensors, but also chemical sensors or biosensors. And uh, below that, we can have. Uh, uh, conversion to digital and we can have processors we can have memory stacks and many kinds of elements we we can have also energy scavengers uh, energy uh, storing elements many ma many new concepts are coming into the picture and obviously all of them are bringing new new problems but also new opportunities uh, silicon we we 
know pretty much about silicon, but how to build uh, circuits which uh, bring together different technologies, completely different materials, is not so obvious. And they, there is a need for a lot of research, okay? So, um, in complicated structures where people were uh, making, you know, trials in introducing, uh, trying to, to use a pretty simple structure with an interposer, but also uh, thinking about what they call a smart interposer, okay? So, it, it, the interposer contains not only interconnections, but also some other kinds of uh, useful building blocks. Uh, power management, uh, connection with uh, photonic uh, uh, networks. Uh, we can put RF platforms and uh, connections to uh, lighting and uh, power computing, power uh, circuitry and, and so on. So there are again, many new, new uh, possible developments there. Uh, if we think about integration, so we have now, we are at the stage of 3D ICs, and the next step probably will be heterogeneous integration. So heterogeneous integration, meaning that uh, various building blocks in 3D or in 2D will be fabricated in totally disconnected technologies, far from silicon. Uh, so, this year, where we are, okay, so th this is last two years to 17, 16, 17, 18. And well, I, I think I also put the new slide, uh, 18, 2019, 2020. So, as you can see, Apple 14 has uh, uh, is a 5 nanometer chip, TSMC technology, 11 billion, almost 12 billion transistors. Uh, AMD produces a, a microprocessor, which has all, almost 40 billion transistors, 1,088 square millimeters, and it has uh, different components inside, fabricated in seven nanometer and in 12 nanometer. So you can see that the, the technologies are really uh, becoming 3D and heterogeneous. And there are more, more to come. But the, the numbers are, are amazing. Okay, so these things you can buy, like the, the Intel Xeon 5 processor, which has uh, on the top of the uh, processor, uh, we have uh, DRAM, the dynamic RAM layers, and several of them. This is just in one chip. We, we can integrate with the uh, processor chip uh, Basically, we can order the chip with different sizes of memory. The, the nearer the memory to the processor, the better. Uh, AMD is, is doing something similar, as you can see. These are the, con the what was concept five years ago. Now it's in the, in the foundries. Now, uh, a few words about memory. Because a big problem in all computing applications is uh, communication between processor and memory. And many people are talking about so-called von Neumann bottleneck. So the, when the, get, the data gets big, uh, the transfer of uh, data between memory and processor becomes difficult. It's a, like, like, like a highway. If there are too many cars uh, in France, when people are going on holiday 1st of August, it's almost impossible to drive from Paris <laughs> south. Uh, and and this is happening also, you know, in uh, in our in our uh, computing equipment. Uh, so we we really need uh, in current applications we need a lot of memory. We need parallel uh, mechanism, and and we need new design concept and technologies. Uh, so f first thing von Neumann proposed to this kind of structure, okay, where we had. Uh, uh, the processing unit, and we had the storage for instructions. So, sorry, for instructions and for the data. Uh, So-called Harvard architecture uh, divided this into two pieces of memory. 
so instruction memory uh, uh, and as you know that 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 was the trend in microprocessor technology that instruction memory was very fast and put together with the with the processor but data memory was still very often outside an interesting observation in in last few years is that the the memories are going also 3d okay. to be faster and uh, allowing us to store more more data uh, it's interesting in conventional applications we have we are doing a lot of computations and uh, the data transfer is only 10 percent now everyone is talking about big data so we, we have loads of data generated by various sources and now data transfer takes 96 percent okay? and not only that if we have such loads of data there are many errors in the transfer okay? so what is happening you know the classic memory cell was like this okay? two-dimensional NAND gate now we introduce three-dimensional NAND gates so we build layers we have technologies that that is important okay so we build layers and layers and layers we have metal field we have uh, so individual cells is a little bit like those nanowires okay? they are not really nanowires but something similar okay but we we can build like pillars with many many uh, memory cells instead of having just one uh, flat uh, array of memory cells we have three dimensional array of memory cells and the latest developments are so called 3d x point technology uh, which is 10 uh, 1000 times faster than anything that was available before uh, and we have also 3d nand architectures which offers nowadays you can you can get one terabyte memory in one chip okay so i i was telling you that my first uh, desktop computer had 10 megabyte hard disk and that was a big achievement in those days and uh, now we have in, in a single chip uh, one terabyte solid state uh, memory ssd and in interestingly uh, intel is uh, doing those things and they this year they they announced fourth generation and it has 144 layers okay the same footprint but we go high three-dimensional vertical uh, layers one on the top of the other instead of flat array of cells we have three-dimensional uh, 144 layers offering uh, one terabyte capacity amazing it's it's truly amazing achievement uh, i would like to the, at the end to mention two problems that probably many of you are are hearing uh, around you and first of all is uh, big data how to deal with big data everyone is talking about big data and artificial intelligence so nowadays these two things are dominating <laughs> many other domains Okay, so the, the big data comes because, because we have uh, uh, developed over the years so many sources of data generating the data. Okay, so we we have um, we have uh, sensors that are measuring uh, uh, many many physical processes around. We have installed uh, sensors in industry. We have hundreds of say, sensors in our cars. We, we have sensors in our telephones. Uh, they are omnipresent in, in uh, uh, electricity uh, installations. We, we have nowadays on, on almost everywhere the uh, measurement devices that are uh, checking what is happening. So and we we have a very large variety of of this uh, data. We have images. We we have uh, uh, signals of different uh, kinds, um, different physical uh, processes. Uh, the volume is is growing. The volume is growing uh, in an incredible way. Uh, here I give you one example. Samsung, in, which is one of the companies producing memories, is uh, telling that uh, by 2025, 
we will have 175 zettabytes of uh, data. And this year, we have to process 44 zettabytes. Okay. This is 10 with 21 zeros zettabyte. Okay. 44 zettabytes. So we have to process it and we have to store it somewhere. Okay. How can we do it? So we we need we need really to uh, fabricate something new. And before I go into that uh, and show you the last slides, uh, I would like to bring you some information about how our brain is operating. So <laughs> our brain, basically the mass is around 1.4 kilogram, 130 gram of which is protein, 100 gram fat, and the remaining is just water. Uh, our brain is around 2% of body mass, uses 20% of oxygen and 25% of glucose, and basically consumes around between 20, 25 watts of power. That's amazing. Very, very low uh, power consumption. It has 86 billion neurons. And it has, I here I stress what, I, what is important. The synapses, the, the, so the interconnects, 100 terabytes, 100 tera synapses, 10 power 14. Okay. So the, the processing uh, uh, capability is around uh, uh, 10 petaflops. Okay. Now, comp compare with the, what, we, what we can build on an integrated circuit. The number of transistors, well, we, we're talking about billion, 50 billions, okay? So here we have uh, uh, 86 billion. So it's all, almost, we are almost there, okay? But interconnect has 10 power 14 synapses. And here we can see a major problem which we are facing nowadays and which I hope you will be also <laughs> interested in looking at it and solving it maybe one day. So this is so-called fan out. So if we have one uh, processing element on a chip, how many other processing elements can we connect to it? And typically what is happening, we connect uh, to nearest neighbors only. So our brain or nature, if you want to put it this way, has solved it in a much, much better way. So we are, we cannot compete. We can pro produce big number of elements, but not connect them as they should be, okay? So, People think that next steps will be going to produce uh, chips that solve artificial intelligence problems. Okay? So far, all the chips that were produced so far are rather flat. They are not 3D. Uh, why I will comment at the end. I show you a few, a few um, examples here. Here is a so-called tensor flow, a tensor core. Okay, Turing processor, uh, NVIDIA Xavier, as you can see, it, it has also uh, specific parts in it. It has many building blocks, but it has uh, Volta GPU here, the CPU cluster here, but also there are uh, spe special accelerators inside. Uh, the most interesting development is uh, what is produced by the company called Cerebras. Maybe you have heard about this. They introduce a concept which is called wafer scale processor. Uh, so instead of using just one uh, little piece, which is visible here, one square, or one rectangle, and have the chip on it, they are using the whole area of the of the wafer. Okay, so. Altogether, they are able to produce a chip which is 46,000 square millimeters. So basically, they are, they are connecting all the chips on the wafer. Uh, so first version had 400,000 cores, uh, used TSMC 16 nanometer process, 18 gigabyte on-chip uh, RAM, and 100 petabytes per second the speed of interconnect. 
The next uh, generation, which was just announced a month ago or so, uh, it it goes to seven nanometer process, and they have two point six trillion transistors on the whole wafer, eight hundred fifty thousand AI artificial intelligence cores. Okay, so just imagine the, those numbers. The numbers are, are shocking. If you think about it, this this one chip one uh, wafer contains uh, if you counted all people living on the earth is basically 342 transistors for every person in the world just one single chip okay what it does basically they they uh, it does simple things uh, which are called uh, multiply and add okay matrix matrix operations they are very uh, resources consuming so uh, here I, I i gave one example of a of a digit classifier uh, as you can see it's a neural network so to to, to do it on chip uh, they are just using it doing it in parallel okay so it takes no time this uh, wafer scale engine does it in uh, fractions of uh, of a millisecond and and this time th th this type of networks is uh, is also implemented for self-driving cars that's another area which is uh, uh, really bringing us uh, fantastic developments in terms of chips uh, this is a tesla full self-driving board it, you can see that there are two specific processors here uh, it's difficult to to know what is inside we are guessing some of the some of the of the blocks that are visible and uh, it has also the, this kind of tensor processor or, or matrix operations uh, special special processors inside it is not learning learning is on off the board we we cannot transfer the data sufficiently fast so we cannot do the training of the networks on the chip still so the bottleneck for for the data transfer is still present there okay but it but it it works in many cases it works we still need to improve it and we can uh, you can see that there are, there are various parts various building blocks inside okay so ending i i i think what will be happening in the next years is most significant challenge is the energy efficiency. That's one thing. So we, uh, if we compare our chips to our brain, uh, our brain does many much more complicated uh, processing things with a little power consumption. Our chips are consuming a lot of power still. So the, the wafer scale processor of Cerebrask consume kilowatts not 20 watts kilo several kilowatts and uh, uh, in my opinion that's my interest my personal interest is heterogeneous stacking how we can uh, put together things that are fabricated in different technologies and uh, one of the areas which myself I am working on is how to incorporate the the um, power uh, storage on chip and thus m make the the circuits uh, or some classes of circuits uh, power uh, independent on the external power supplies okay so standard ways are not working any anymore we need new tools new we need to develop new conceptual design tools new ways of thinking and working and enhance creativity. No tools for heterogeneous microcircuits so far. And obviously, on the, as we uh, uh, operate in the computer era, we are not. Uh, years ago, electronic engineers were breadboarding everything. So they put parts on the available parts on the on the desk, and they were soldering wires and so on. Now we cannot do it. <laughs> we can we can put together circuits in the computer and do as much as uh, 
possible testing in the computer, optimize the circuit, um, visualize all possible effects that are happening there, and and then construct only construct when we make sure that they they should work. Okay, so that's uh, that's the end. I hope I wasn't too too long. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Maciek. It was an interesting talk. So now if we're going to move. Uh, you're very welcome. <laughs> uh, so now we're going to move to uh, question section. So we have uh, a question from uh, Adrien Vincent. He say, uh, are electromagnetic compatibility and electromagnetic interference question more of a problem with the 3D chips due to the such highly integrated uh, structure, one right above another? For example, isn't floor planning becoming significantly harder when considering uh, heterogeneous uh, integrated chips? Okay, it's a very good question. Thank you for asking it. Uh, obviously, you know, when, when we put many things on the one on the top of the other, uh, wires are, you know, the electromagnetic field is uh, creating problems because, uh, uh, well, what is happening in one wire is influencing everything around. So th this is becoming a, a difficult problem. Uh, well, we we need, as I mentioned, we need uh, good simulation tools to uh, see what are the effects, uh, how we can optimize uh, uh, the construction of the of the interconnect. Uh, it's it's a very significant problem. Uh, well, I, I probably I am not able in this short time to to explain more, but but this problem is is clearly uh, uh, visible. And, and several labs are, are working in this direction. So we, uh, we know about it. If I may represent other researchers, we know about it and many labs are, are trying to, to um, take this into account and, and see what are the effects and uh, whether these effects are stronger in 3D than they are in normal structures is always a, a good question. Uh, Probably we are able to put also like intermediate layers, which will protect in some cases. Uh, we, we can also optimize the, the positioning of the, uh, of the various building blocks uh, in, a, in a similar way that we are doing with, uh, uh, with thermal influences also, because thermal effects are also very important. It may be equally uh, important as electromagnetic ones. If if we have a processor at the at the bottom of the stack, obviously the processor is uh, producing a lot of heat, and the heat and it's heating all the other layers. So so we try to to position those uh, blocks that are producing heat, you know, in specific positions, and 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 also people are coming with completely new ideas like. Uh, uh, thermal vias, so we can introduce in a three-dimensional structure like like a chimney in the house, or a vert vertical channel that is uh, taking the heat out in a specific place. Electromagnetic is more difficult because we cannot build a chimney to take the electromagnetic uh, pollution out of the chip. But well, we can we can make protections if needed. But it's an important problem. That's clear. Thank you for your answer. Uh, the next question is uh, uh, also related to the last latest uh, remark you give. Um, it's a uh, it's is there a risk that heat extraction quickly becomes a serious challenge with the such three D chips? Well, it depends on the on the kind of chip we fabricate. If we if we um, well, we, we have certain applications that, you know, uh, for example, if we want to put, uh, I don't know, 100 processing cores on, on a chip. So each of those cores is, uh, is producing heat, okay? So we, we try to introduce uh, various mechanisms, how to control uh, 
so we are trying not to use if possible not to use all the processors at the same time uh, we we introduce uh, hardware software co-design in such a way that the software can switch off certain parts of the chip if if they are overheating and some other parts can uh, take uh, the the function of those uh, parts that are overheating so th there are many strategies that for 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 the heating problem it largely depends on on what kinds of blocks we we have uh, i think one of the for me most interesting areas is the internet of things which not necessarily has you know very high uh, power consuming processing units in it uh, so the processor uh, is relatively uh, using a little, relatively little power but uh, on the other hand we would like to be independent on the power supply so to introduce on chip or uh, on the block uh, power supply and this is possible because people already i well i know i had no time today to talk about it but we have integrated batteries fabricated in completely different materials than than silicon we we have uh, power capacitors it, it sounds pretty amazing but with the new materials on a one square centimeter you can imagine uh, and and this is available on the industrial scale like uh, half a farad capacitance so we can obviously the voltages are, are small operating voltages but half a farad can store a lot of energy so so we have those power uh, power supply elements that are possible to be integrated and they are waiting to be integrated and first trials are, are being made it's it's still far from you know processors that consume hundreds of watts but that's without external power supply it's impossible to imagine they could work so it depends on the application okay thank you very much for the question uh, for the answer um we don't have any more questions so i will thank you again for this pr interesting presentation and um, thank you, thank if, you, you for if you have more questions you, you can also send them by mail if you want to ask questions in french i can also answer in french okay uh, so, so. It has no, no problem it's a pleasure always to you know interact with uh, students it's it also brings new ideas in many cases so <laughs> true thank you thank very you much very, thank you very much and thank you for the audience uh, we will uh, organize next week an, uh, uh, another talk so be sure to be here and uh, so see you next week <laughs>